JD's and Letterman, we are back. We've done damn did it again. A whole new mini series, Battle Royale is back on the menu, boys. So do old dad a favor, hit that little subscribe button and drop a comment for the algorithm gods. You've earned it and Eugene will bless you. So Battle Royale mod close emitter. That's right, red dot season, it's amongst us, boys. We have gathered a posse, a gaggle, a flock, of the best of the best close emitter red dot pistol sights on the market and we're putting them head to head. We're gonna test the durability of the optics and its glass, reliability, and how they handled the stress of those long hard nights of LARPing in my mother's basement, the field of view, and more. All right, so now I know it's just the boys. Quick note I just wanna make for you guys. This channel here, it's 100% self-funded. No mega contracts, you know, I've sold my soul for, for checks getting dropped into my bank account to tell you what's good, what's bad, and how you're missing out if you don't consume the latest and greatest. I'm just a regular guy with an unhealthy gun obsession and a 401k that's uh, lacking in attention just to say the least. Stonks, baby. I just do this for fun, you know, I shoot like five days a week at my farm, and on one of those days, I play dress up and bring a camera and LARP for the boys. If you think that's cool, hell yeah. If that ain't your thing, Hell yeah, do you my dudes, 2024 is gonna be the year of the people and I'm here to serve the kings of the community. So gentlemen, let's begin. We've gathered the Trijicon RCR, Aimpoint Acro P2, the Steiner MPS, Hollow Sun 509T, Lead and Steel PB3 and the Cycle Bear. Phew, I ain't seen so much glass since they dropped that nuke out in the desert. So what we're gonna do guys is we're gonna roll out each optic in its own video. We'll talk about the features of each optic, get your eyes behind the glass, and let you make your own educated opinions about each piece. Once each optic has been rolled out and you know showcased in its own video, we're gonna put them all head to head and declare one winner. We are gonna get to the bottom of closed emitter red dots and decide which dot is gonna perform the absolute best. Which has the best balance of ruggedness and glass? which dot is going to be the absolute most bang for your buck and help you make the most educated purchase possible. So at the risk of my own financial security, friend, let's dive in. So you ask, what exactly is a closed emitter red dot? Well, the concept is rather new to pistols, but you know, the actual closed emitter red dot sight is not. In fact, it's a rather proven design. Aimpoint is the first one that comes to mind when you think of red dot sights. It's not just the P2 and you know, the Aimpoint T2 but all the way back in like the 80s and 90s. A laser-like emitter projects its dot on the glass and you see it. And when you see the dot, you put it on the target and you pull the trigger. It's really pretty much that simple. Now, obviously there's a little bit more going on and it's a little bit more in depth than that. However, that's the shortest and quickest cliff notes you know I can give you. So essentially there's two types of pistol red dot sights, open and closed emitter. And the name, it's pretty self-explanatory. The emitter, the dot that you do see, it's gonna either be enclosed in a glass case of emotion, you know, protected from all the elements, or it's gonna be open. Now, we're not here to decide which is gonna be more gooder because that's coming and that's in the works for a later video. For now, we need to decide which dot trapped in that glass case of emotion is most goodest. But yeah, you know, the whole idea with a closed emitter is that you're not gonna have, you know, any of the issues associated with, you know, the elements like mud, rain, sand, dirt, belly button lit, and little Debbie crumbs. The emitter is encapsulated in the housing and that housing keeps all the stuff out. So when you actually go to draw and use your piece, you see your target in a nice crisp dot, you know, not a chunk of your cosmic brownie. Rad, right? So let's talk about the optic of the day, the Aimpoint Acro P2. The most distinguished mailbox on the market by far, the OG closed emitter of pistol dots. Now, it's safe to say Aimpoint is undoubtedly the absolute king of red dot sights and the goat of all dot optics. Hands down, Aimpoint is combat proven in just about every single theater possible. They simply make durable and quality stuff. Now, for the P2, they're pretty proud of this thing. You know, it's $600. In fact, they're pretty proud of pretty much everything they make. Their stuff simply isn't cheap. So, when they first made their pistol dot, it was a pretty big deal in like 2018 AD, you know. Rumor has it, some intern will call him Beta. Beta made a suggestion at a boardroom meeting. He was only supposed to be, you know, transcribing it. So reports were flying in that high-tier basement LARPerators, that's an operator who LARPs, LARPerator, <laughs> needed something to protect their RMRs from the devastating and continuous assault from their Little Debbie cakes filling up the open emitter optics and weren't able to operate nearly as hard. And their mothers were getting big mad at the screams and frustrations coming from their 32-year-old basement dwellers. So, Beta, being a fellow higher-tier LARPerator, suggested, what if, like, 
We built a case around the laser emitter, but not, you know, make it good looking. No, 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 no. We make it like a huge brick, like a mailbox, and make it, you know, have the field of view of a straw. Rumor has it, Beta was given a nice vice president job at NASA or something for such an amazing idea. Yeah, that's like exactly how it went down. Exactly. So, that was the first iteration, the P1. Now we have the P2, introduced in you know, the last year or so. Now, I say the P2 has been one of the best selling closed emitter pistol dots next to Hollow Sun on the market, period. You see them pretty often. You know, it's a very popular optic for folks that want a closed emitter and are searching for a brand that's well established. In fact, it was really the only alternative to Hollow Sun for the longest time and vice versa for closed emitters. So, I hadn't really had much experience with close emitter dots. In fact, really back, uh, I don't know, say five, six months ago, I had essentially zero experience with close emitter pistol dots. Now, the P2 at that time was full steam ahead on the hype train. I mean, it was going. People were raving about this thing, and you know, rightfully so, I suppose. No more zebra cakes in your optic is a major dub, in my opinion. I'm pretty sure at one point I read a guy saying like, you know, on the internet, so you have to believe it's true. It's the only optic that makes your gun like shoot homing missiles or something. I don't know. The internet is wild, bro. But yeah, that's actually where I got the idea from this mini series and where it all started. People raving about closed emitters and how they solved all the issues in the world. So I bought one myself and decided, you know, let's get all of them. Let's get the best of them. So I bought one of these cute little microwave boxes here and got it all mounted up. Overall, you know, the first impressions that you get when you go to present your pistol after everything's all mounted on there, they kind of just, you know, the first impressions that really stick out and kind of just, you know, sock you in the mouth. First thing I want to talk about, the field of view. So the best way to put it is it's pretty much legitimately like you're looking through a tunnel. It's extremely, extremely narrow. There's a significant amount of housing surrounding the glass. And in my opinion, maybe just a little too much. I mean, I'm not an astro science rocketist or whatever, obviously, but I do feel like we could probably have gotten by, you know, with making the glass a little bit larger or even better, make the housing a little bit larger to facilitate bigger and wider glass so you don't feel like, you know, you're peeping down a tunnel. You know, I don't know. I mean, obviously the engineers are much more intelligent than myself, but also not sure what they were thinking there. Now you ask, why is it important? You shouldn't be looking through the glass. You should be focusing on getting the dot onto the target and not how much space there is in the glass. Well, Mr. Beautiful Viewer, that is a well-rounded response and tip, and that's an absolute fact. You're exactly correct. But this is where the problem of the tunnel effect comes into play. Take a look at this video here. What you're seeing, obviously, is the dot going in and out of your sight picture. But here's the problem with that. Because the glass is so narrow, you'll lose sight of that dot much easier than something, you know, with a larger sight picture and a wider field of view. This is a kind of an issue that plagues all closed emitters, not just the P2. But when it comes to the P2, you know, there's very little room for error, and you can see it, it's much more pronounced of an issue. You see, pretend the camera is your eyeballs here. When I move the pistol about here, back and forth, up and down, it's very easy to potentially lose sight of your dot. And well, I'm not gonna lie, boys. Seeing your dot, in my opinion, is a very important thing. Think of it like, you know, from the Iron Sight Gang's point of view. You can point shoot off your front sight post with, you know, pretty reasonable accuracy with not a tremendous amount of skill as a shooter. But in order to make that perfectly accurate shot, you got to get that front dot in between, you know, the bucket of the rear iron sight. And if you have your pistol canted or something or it's not perfectly in line with your eye, well, you're going to have a bad time getting good, accurate shots onto the target. Same with the tunnel of the P2. There's just little room for error on your draw to presentation and acquisition of your sight picture. I mean, simply put, when you have a larger hunk of glass, you can see the dot from more sharper angles and quickly make that correction if you don't have the perfect pistol presentation and get to work. And it's not just in the pistol presentation that you know it's a tight window and to find that dot. With the P2, I found myself really struggling quite a few times during transitions, you know, going from target to target, swinging the pistol left to right, back and forth just searching for that next steal and then trying to find that dot. I kind of look like a clown at times being like, you know, I was afraid to pull the trigger on a piece of paper or a piece of steel. Ha, jokes on you. I just can't see my dot. <laughs> so yeah, tunnel view of a straw. Anyways, sometimes I just rant. Glad we got that out of the way first. Let's talk about just like the construction and features of this guy. 
So there's some things I feel they did really well with this thing, you know, looks overall, I think it's pretty sharp, but then there's some things that just simply make, you know, zero sense. Let's talk about what makes zero sense first, the battery cap cover. First of all, the street price on this optic is right under $600. So yeah, pretty expensive, not a cheap optic by any means, but aim point decided a cheap junk booty sweat plastic battery cap was the best option for this high end optic. Like what? So part of my testing was unloading and reloading the battery, seeing how easy it is to unscrew and put it back together if you needed to ASAP or, you know, just whatever. And to be quite frank with you, it's kind of a pain in the ass. I think the pinnacle of a good battery cover is that it should be able to be taken off and torqued back down with basically the shell case lip that you found on the ground. And as you can see here, I tried that first. And as you can see, we mangled this poor thing. Now, since this thing is plastic, it got all torn up very easily before I even got the thing off. If they'd spent just like, I don't know, let's call it a dollar more in decent metal, we'd be fine. But now I've got to live with this mangled battery cap. Yeah, obviously I can buy a replacement one, or maybe I should have just used a larger flathead screwdriver to get it off. But that's not the point. At the point of the price, I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to buy a replacement battery cap. I shouldn't have to get, you know, a $40 Knight's Armament one to put on there so it's more durable. I don't want to have to carry a gigantic flathead screwdriver either, just in case, you know, it does go down and I'm nowhere near my bench. Which brings me to the next point of odd construction and first impressions. The elevation and windage turns. Again, these kinds of things should be as simple as sticking the lip of a case in there and cranking it to whatever you need, but instead, you need their special little two prong tool or an Allen key to change that point of impact. So another stupid little tool that's taking up space in my kit that should be filled with oatmeal cream pies. I'm just not sure what, you know, logic they really had behind this one. I don't think I've ever in my life bumped zero accidentally or changed my zero on a pistol dot. It's always been an intentional thing and it's always been with a spent shell case. So the need for some little goofy two prong tool or an Allen key doesn't really make much sense to me. Literally, a spent case or even a thumbnail is all I should need to zero a pistol dot. Set it, mark it with a chalk marker, and forget about it. I think the part I dislike most about it isn't that it's, you know, different or it needs, you know, a special tool to be easier. It's that pretty much it needs the tool, period, to even adjust it. You know, I tried lodging the point of a 5.56 pill in there, but that really didn't get it to work either. Realistically, if I could apply good pressure, you know, and just my thumb, I may not even have brought this up to change, you know, that point of zero. But since I kind of really need an Allen key or their special tool, I really feel like, you know, this is something we should harp on. I'm not entirely sure what Aimpoint thought you know they were solving with this you know by putting those kind of turrets on there but you know to be honest I feel like it's just kind of creating a problem another thing the clamp mounting system while I haven't personally had any issues with this I have seen dozens and dozens of p2s with broken clamps here at the base now why is that that's because it's not say like a billet piece of steel it's aluminum and it splits very easily if you just slightly over torque that clamp. Now it's not going to be a problem if you don't go throwing, you know, a ton of Ugga Duggas at it. But the problem is it doesn't take a ton of Ugga Duggas to split it. It's a very, very fine line from what I have found to actually, you know, saying that's going to work, slap it, that thing's going nowhere. And a swear word infused trash can spike down into the trash can with the aim point optic. They're pretty daggone fragile. Now guys, you should be using an adjustable torque driver when installing any optics, period, to avoid this. But even one little tiny blimp or flaw in the manufacturing process of that clamp wouldn't even be an issue if it was, say, like billet steel. But because it's aluminum, you know, it can easily become a worthless optic with the current aluminum setup. Now, I'm sure the reason they did this is to protect the threads of the optic to make sure that the clamp splits first instead of you, you know, cross threading it, stripping out the threads, whatever. At least, you know, that's my best guess. And that does make sense. It would make the most sense to educate your customers first on the proper amount of inch pounds needed to secure it into position and where to apply your thread locker. Now, I get it. We're men. We don't read instructions. But I do feel like it would save Aimpoint themselves and the customers a whole lot of headache if they simply, you know, just put like a sticker over the steel clamp or over that aluminum clamp. And you know that the customer has to take off and is actually inclined to read instead of, you know, just gripping and ripping and getting that thing on there. You know, I get it. The general population as a whole isn't exactly Albert Einstein, but you don't need to be Albert Einstein, you know, to look at the sticker. You have to take off before you mount this. 
Hell, I'm not even Albert Einstein. I'm pretty much probably on the spectrum, self-diagnosed. I don't know, but a sticker or even like a laser engraved somewhere on the body, underneath of it, on the side with the proper torque specs, if you want to continue to use, you know, not so durable clamp materials. So if HK can etch round log and, you know, warning labels on a bajillion rifles, Aimpoint might be able to etch some directions on the housing. I get it, you know, again, the customer should be more intelligent than this, but you know, as a whole, you have to assume the customer is, you know, the first time buyer kind of person. So another gripe, whose idea was it to make the glass nearly flush with the exterior housing? I need to know, because here's the thing, want to know the best way to stop busting glass? Spend more money and put better glass in it. Customers are already paying $600. I promise they will pay the difference for better, more strong glass. But do you want to know the second best way that really won't cost anything? Recess the glass just a touch more than like 0.00005 of a millimeter back behind the housing. The amount of spiderweb Aimpoint P2s I have seen is legitimately frightening to the point where I wouldn't even consider this thing like a duty rated optic. And the fact that glass is almost perfectly in line with the exterior of the housing makes it so much more susceptible to a permanent open emitter damage mod to your dot. It's so dang easy to get a direct impact to the glass with this thing. Even things as simple as reholstering your weapon can simply have you pressing the glass directly onto the kydex, your belt, whatever. If you compare it now to say something like the RMR, the glass is not only angled to deflect and dissipate the, you know, the damage of those impacts, but also recessed into the housing, meaning only smaller objects are more likely to hit that glass and bigger objects are going to be stopped by, you guessed it, the housing. I suppose the reason for doing so is to absolutely, you know, minimize the odds of mud caking up on the glass. But guess what? It's not going to stop it. If you have a recessed glass or you have something that's completely flush, when you get mud on the glass, you're still going to have to wipe it off. One good dig with your finger or your shirt is going to cure it until you can get into a position to where you can actually sit down and clean it thoroughly. Again, not sure why this was overlooked, but I think it's a tremendous L on their part. I've seen spent shells getting ejected directly into the glass, and I've seen dudes climbing on an incline, wipe out, get some gravel pinging off the rear glass, and busting it up. Now, that's not to say all pistol dots wouldn't break from the same kind of impacts, but it's absolutely going to make your optic more prone to becoming an open emitter with the glass perfectly flat and perfectly flush with your housing. Also, why would you give me such a perfect cocking lever here for the optic racks if you didn't make the glass a little recessed into, you know, the optic housing? You know, making my glass smearing it up and potentially crashing into it. Okay, so maybe you shouldn't rack your pistol with your optic. But then again, why shouldn't you? A well-designed pistol optic should be able to handle and withstand and that kind of, you know, low stress. Okay, am I being a little hard on it? Oh, you betcha, but guess what, there's more. So, how about the brightness settings? It's super small and super close to each other. You know, it's not a huge and, you know, legitimate gripe really, but it is kind of something that should be stated. I feel it would be a little bit easier to manipulate them if they were, you know, further apart on opposite sides or something, you know, whatever. They're on the left side of the dot, which subjectively is actually kind of nice to me. So I can take, you know, just my support hand off the weapon to manipulate the buttons while maintaining a good and solid grip on the gun and keep it pointed directly at the target for potentially having to use it again without actually having, you know, to camp the pistol, roll it over, see exactly where I'm at. But for lefties, kind of sorry about your luck because it's going to be on the opposite side that you probably would want it on. I feel like a top mounted controls would be like the most neutral position without sacrificing really anything. Now, I do got to say the dot is pretty crisp. It's not super, super bright, but it's also not, you know, having you out here dropping it on max brightness, wondering where the dot is still at. It's adequate. It's definitely brighter than most, but you know, it's definitely also not the brightest. Overall, I gotta say guys, you know, the Aimpoint P2 is probably one of the most underwhelming pistol dots I have ever used. And it really makes it worse that it comes at a $600 price tag and from a company with probably the best red dot sites on earth, period. I'm just gonna declare it. Aimpoint makes the best red dot sites. They're combat proven. Time and time again, Sandbox, Ukraine, wherever there is a major conflict, Aimpoint has probably been there. And I guess, you know, to put it simply, it just kind of hurts the feelers to have, you know, undeniably the best red dot optic maker on the market. Put something out that, you know, I'm just crazy underwhelmed by. In fact, 
disappointed. Maybe I'm being too harsh, but you know, that's what I'm here for, to nitpick and be harsh on expensive items and tell you guys what I think about it. You know, my opinions, they're my own trash opinions, but you know, there is some legitimacy I do feel like to the, you know, my trash opinion. So I'm sure I'm going to be getting, you know, some fan mail here. But uh, hey, if I offend some folks with my honesty, I'm here for it because that's probably doing a good thing. So is the product worth a coin? Do we have the best clothes emitter on the market right here? Well, you'll have to subscribe and tune in for the next one. We have the RCR, the Aimpoint P2, the Lead and Steel, PB3, Holosun, 509T, Steiner MPS, and Cycle Bear. They're all going head to head, and there will be only one left standing, the best pistol dot on the market for close emitters. So, boys, until then, subscribe and flex skills, not dollar bills.